Thanks so much. Very honored to be here uh, to talk today. Um, uh, as Lance said, I'm basically finishing up my research at UCSF uh, the next couple weeks, but look forward to uh, joining the team at uh, Providence very soon. Uh, my talk will be a little different. Uh, it'll be very kind of specific projects uh, that I've done in ALS over the years. The uh, pseudobulbar affect project is actually one I did as a medical student, uh, but uh, as you'll see, it's a very personal project to me, so I always uh, enjoy the invitation to talk more about it. Um, and that'll be the, actually the majority of my talk, and then the, the, the imaging biomarkers, it's a little uh, more kind of into MRI kind of stuff, so I'll just kind of try to give the, the major points of that project. Um, so uh, I think actually many people might be uh, familiar with pseudobulbar affect, um, but I always think it helps to just uh, kind of show a video. Uh, uh, of just to have you experience this yourself if you have not. Um, so this is a patient I, I've known quite well. Um, I've met him uh, in many research projects. He's very active in our ALSA community and chapter uh, down in the Bay Area. Uh, he's won kind of lots of all-star awards and just participates in almost all the research projects he can. Um, so anyway, in this video, he, he's basically asked, when was the last time you had an episode of emotion that was difficult to control? We had just passed to my wife and two sons. Um, I couldn't finish the um, As you can see, that these episodes were very big, lasted a long time for him. Um, actually, he was not too uncomfortable with his uh, laughing episodes, but what he was explaining was he was in the car with his family and trying to read directions, and he thought his voice sounded a little funny, and then he just could not stop laughing, and the episode lasted probably even longer than it did here, um, like about five minutes or so. Um, and that would be a, a, a little laughing episode, but not all the episodes are like that, as big and as long. So this... Uh, this video here is actually my father who was diagnosed with ALS. Um, so this is kind of what makes this, uh, this project very personal to me. So just to give you a little background, I was actually born in, uh, up here in Portland at OHSU. Uh, and then um, my dad was a neurologist and recruited down to UCSF. So I moved down to UCSF uh, in the Bay Area and I've just kind of lived up and down the coast doing my training the last 30 years, happy to come back. Um, but when I was finishing up my undergrad at UCSD, uh, that's when my father was diagnosed with ALS. So I quickly moved home to become a caregiver uh, and to be with him. And it was during that time I was uh, caregiving for him full time and I decided to go to med school. Um, but for this project, what was um, inter or surprising to me is he started developing these uncontrolled episodes of kind of both laughing and crying that were very different for him. So we would just be watching uh, like a Visa commercial or something would start making him cry, or the comedies now were just really extremely funny to my dad. And I wouldn't say it was never not emotional, but he was very stoic and usually very kind of controlled with his emotions. Um, so I'll just show you uh, this example, that his episodes were very different. Uh, they're kind of much more brief, but very strong for him. Uh, and here he's using some low-tech communication equipment. But what he's also saying is that, uh, so my sister's actually translating, it's a low-tech, it's like a, uh, an alphabet board, and he's basically saying that when uh, he ever, he's asked the same thing, when do you always feel an episode or something triggered these episodes, he'll actually say that uh, he thinks of this Brink alarm commercial, and this burglar breaks in, and this woman's screaming, and, and he always thinks of the, that uh, as my, being my sister, who's sitting right there, and it causes an episode. So his are just very hey. brief but strong. Advertisement. 
Frank's alarm commercial. Frank's alarm commercial. Uh, and what happens? What happens when that happens? So his were brief, but very strong. Uh, sometimes these are uncomfortable for people to watch, but as a caregiver, I probably saw uh, you know, thousands of these episodes like these. And um, you know, at the time, I'll tell you a little about with the literature, but as a medical student, I thought, well, this is a way I think I, think I could probably get some answers, because this is a very under-researched area, especially back when I was doing this back around when I applied for the grant was about 2009, 2010. So uh, what Pseudobarber affect uh, in the literature at the time was they really talked about these bursts of unwanted emotion. Uh, usually crying and laughing only, uh, very large and strong, and thought to be unpredictable. So people would write these case reports of, I'd open a door and someone will start laughing and crying, or I'll move a sheet, and they, they didn't really think there's emotion connected to these at all. So they thought these uh, episodes were really kind of empty emotion. Um, and these are thought to be always as a consequence of neurologic disease, and as many names. So uh, pathological laughing and crying, inappropriate emotional display disorder, and emotional incontinence. Uh, so it does happen in many neurological settings, so stroke, uh, brain injury, tumors, uh, multiple sclerosis, progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, but, but some reports are saying it happens in up to 50% of ALS, so it's probably the most common setting. And I think in my personal experience, I see it probably more in about 30%, uh, but this association with neurologic disease suggests that it's not psychological. So why study pseudobulbar affect? Uh, so significant impact on the quality of life, I think especially if it bothers people. So I've met, uh, at least I think in our uh, society, I think men feel uncomfortable crying in public and having these really large bursts of display if they're going to the mall or going you know, out in public. Uh, but I will say I've met women who have laughing types and uh, you know, they feel it's very inappropriate if they're gonna go to a funeral or a wedding and have some of these episodes. So they've really actually you know, not gone to those. Um, so the pathophysiology is poorly understood, specific cognitive psychological mechanisms, uh, so the specific anatomical structures, neurochemical mechanisms that might be involved. Also, this might help our understanding of normal emotion and understand the neuroanatomy of emotion. So why the study this in ALS? Again, uh, the high prevalence. Uh, patients are cognitively intact, so we believe they'll give us reliable self-report, and also that it might be identified uh, pathologically homogenous features. So I think very specific features specifically to ALS rather than trying to do all the disease groups. And then for me, I already mentioned it's kind of a personal project. So this is kind of a brainstorm of questions I had before I even started the project. Um, uh, so I didn't get to answer all these, but I, I tried. I got some of these answered. So can this be studied in a lab? Again, people are kind of saying these are just totally random. It's like catching lightning in a bottle. Uh, how does this relate to normal emotion? So how or why do these episodes occur? So is this just spontaneously occurring, not linked to the environment at all, which implies the spontaneous firing of emotional machinery not linked to normal emotion processing? Um, are they induced in the same way as normal emotions? Implies that these are probably exaggerated emotions and actually linked. What's the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of pseudobulbar affect? It can it be treated behaviorally as well as medicinally. And also when I initially applied for the grant, Nudexta had not been approved yet, which now, um, which now is approved. Uh, so emotions are, are complex, but here's, uh, I think, a simple way, uh, how at least I was think, thinking about them and trained to kind of think about them. And I will admit my bias is this is from the Levinson Lab in UC Berkeley and James Gross Lab down in Stanford, who are um, probably some of the bigger emotion researchers here on the West Coast. So emotions start with an antecedent event. This is faces, voices, smells, uh, thoughts, memories. Then we go through an appraisal process with this valence, so is this positive, is this negative? Does this have any personal relevance to me? Do I have any normal kind of action tendencies when I have experienced these things? And then this produces a response. So facial expressions, change in your speech, change in autonomic reactivity, um, is there any kind of normal stereotyped response or physical actions? Uh, now emotions are not um, quite that simple because we can regulate our emotions. So there are different ways that you, people can do these. So one way is avoidance. So this would be if you, um, you, you know, say you don't like scary movies, so you just decide not to go. Or if you end up being scared, you just leave the room. So that would be an example of avoidance. The next mechanism would be uh, reappraisal. 
So this is, you're actually going uh, out on a, on a date and they want to see a scary movie, but you don't want them to know that you're feeling scared. So you go into the movie and you just constantly remind yourself, uh, this, is just, this is just a movie that's very bad makeup, that's very bad CGI, I'm not scared. So you're getting, kind of emotionally distancing yourself before you feel the emotion. And the other way of uh, regulating your emotion is suppression. So this is later, and it's not really when you're actually feeling the emotion, and you're actually physically suppressing it so you're not showing it on your face. Um, so what might be happening in pseudobarbaraffect in this model? So one might be the appraisal process is off. So that means that uh, a happy face to someone might look less or, or more, and people are kind of uh, have the wrong kind of gauge for what might be triggering the response. The other might be the response is exaggerated, so the happy face could be small or, or large, and it uh, doesn't matter what it is because the response is always going to be exaggerated. And the other possibility is maybe there's an issue with the regulation. Um, so as it turns out, these different aspects of emotional processing are, sort of, are associated with different neuroanatomical structures. So human and animal studies have shown that actually some of our uh, basic emotional reactions are generated in subcortical structures like the brainstem uh, that kind of generates that initial response. And the frontal lobes and limbic system have kind of been uh, associated with basically these uh, frontal lobe uh, with uh, regulation. So, so one of the theories, uh, or one way to think about pseudobulbar affect is one mechanism might be that there's a faulty brainstem circuitry that's overactive, always producing an exaggerated response. Or there might be more of a disconnection syndrome uh, where the frontal lobes don't regulate a normal acting brainstem. So this theory is actually quite old. Uh, this is actually Samuel Alexander Kinnear Wilson. Uh, he wrote a paper, uh, well, he's wrote many papers, uh, uh, but uh, he's most famous for his uh, paper his dissertation in 1912. Uh, it was basically called Wilson's disease, which is this abnormal accumulation of copper. However, he also wrote another very important paper, at least to me. Uh, he wrote this in the Journal of Neurology and Psychopathology in 1924. Some problems in neurology. Number two, pathological laughing and crying. So he wrote in 1924 about a facial respiratory center, and he thought that there was voluntary and involuntary pathways from the frontal lobes that controlled an emotional response into the physiology of the brainstem. Uh, and even at the time, back then, he was even backing these up with uh, four, a case series of about four patients and, uh, and, and uh, pathology studies. So who did we study? So we brought in ALS patients into the lab. We included patients with both pseudobulbar affect and without pseudobulbar affect. Uh, We'd screen patients for frank dementia, stroke, uh, brain stent tumors. We wanted to study events and wanted to try to examine reactivity and regulation. So we would have a pre-session interview making sure patients had pseudobulbar affect uh, and pr to predict possible stimuli to capture these events um, in kind of a controlled setting. And then in the lab, we would have this free form uh, interview. Uh, and this was kind of just more of a descriptive part of the paper and, and tell, kind of people having just tell us how, the, how this affects their lives and how they might try to deal with this. Um, and then we also had films. We had these kind of standardized antecedent events and that's what this, uh, the Berkeley Psychophysiology Lab bases all their, their research on. So my session was set up kind of like this. So there was a interview session, very free form, usually lasting between 30 and 60 minutes. Then we'd ask people to watch films and then we have some regulation task to give them, and then we'd have a startle response, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So for suppression, um, we'd ask people, hide your feelings, pretend that someone is watching you and do not want them to be able to tell that you are feeling anything about the film. For reappraisal, we'd say, adopt a detached and unemotional attitude and try to think about what you're seeing in such a way that you feel less emotion. Um, so then we give strong stimuli examples. I actually cut these just for time constraints, but just to show that we, you know, just to give some examples of what we would show. So we showed a clip of 21 grams where Naomi Watts gets some very bad news about her family being in a car accident. Everybody rates this, uh, patients with and without ALS rate this as very sad. Uh, and then we have an, amuse, an example of one of the amusing clips we have is a Saturday Night Live clip with Steve Martin, and pretty much everyone thinks it's funny. Uh, so then we also want to choose, include an acoustic startle. So this has a very standard antecedent event, which is a loud noise. Uh, then it very quickly goes through the appraisal process and creates the stereotype response. 
um, was very hardwired, thought to involve the lower brainstem areas, causes this stereotype behavioral reaction of closing your eyes, scrunching the shoulders, also creates an increased heart rate, skin conductance, and people generally report fear. So this is kind of thought to involve lots of different areas in the lower brainstem center, but I just kind of think of this as the emotions way of kind of probing the brainstem. So this is kind of how we, we thought about this. And just to give you a quick example of what that's like, People forgave me for that. Um, they were consented. They, they heard they might hear what loud noises. Um, but anyway, emotions are complex. Uh, so they include how we feel, displays in our body and face, uh, as well as autonomic reactivity. So how would we measure these in the lab? So uh, for how we feel, we'd have very detailed self-report. Uh, for the display, we'd talk about this facial muscle activity or coding, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then for autonomic reactivity, we'd basically be measuring patient's heart rate, respiratory rate, skin conductance, body temperature, blood pressure, and activity throughout the whole session since we didn't know when these episodes might occur. So as you can see, it's, very, it's not exactly a polygraph, but it's, it's kind of similar to that. Um, so I have a quick clip that I think is, is just kind of a, a nice clip, and it gives you a little bit of insight into the, the coding and introduction. So um, bear with me here. It's about two minutes. We don't have time for this scientist to talk to the guy. We went at him for four hours and got nothing. Now, the FBI knows you want mass casualties. So right now, ATF is searching every inch of the two largest black churches in state. The FBI got it wrong. Well, there's a shocker. Not one of those two churches. Maybe you want one of the smaller churches, one of the black suburbs. You know what you're talking about. Don't respond. What do you say ATF starts with Southbridge? No, I'm only kidding. We're gonna skip that one. We're gonna focus on Lawton. You feel good about it? That's it, Lawton. Going after a church in Lawton. That accusation has no basis. What do you mean? You just told me. The ATF found a pipe bomb in the church basement in Lawton an hour later. DOD friend of mine right. said this guy's a total nut job. I heard he spent like three years in the African jungle with some primitive tribe studying their eyebrows. What's his reaction to my statement? Right now, ATF is searching every inch of the two largest black churches in the state. Now, what you just saw there was a brief expression of happiness on his face, which he was trying his best to conceal. It lasted for less than a fifth of a second as what we call a micro-expression. Now, look at his mouth. The suspect is secretly happy about the locations we are searching, which tells me we have the wrong locations. Now I tell him of our new plan and... I know what you're talking about. Classic one-sided shrug. Translation, I have absolutely no confidence in what I just said. The body contradicts the words. He's lying. Yeah. When you accuse a suspect and he acts surprised, is there a way to tell if it's real or if he's just trying to look innocent? Now, that's real surprise. Lasts for less than a second when it comes across the face. But if your suspect is surprised for more than a second, he's faking it. He's lying. Now, I call out that this target is actually Lawton. And watch it again. Concealed scorn. And one personal tip. You see this micro expression in your spouse's face, your marriage is coming to an end. Trust me. <laughs> Uh, don't these micro-expressions vary depending on the person? Let's leave this up and we'll go to the Cato Kalin footage from the OJ trial. Mr. Kalin, you got a lot of money for your appearance on Current Affair, didn't you? Um, yeah. Scorn! Scorn. Huge scorn. <coughs> shame, shame, and shame. Contempt. These expressions are universal. Emotion looks the same whether you're a suburban housewife or a suicide bomber. The truth is written on all our faces. Before, that's lie to me. It's kind of a CSI based on these principles from a lot of the psychology labs. And we weren't believing, we, you know, we didn't think people were lying to us. We weren't looking for concealed scorn or uh, one-sided shrugs per se, but uh, we were looking at that kind of just emotion looking universal across everyone's uh, face. So it, and actually that show is based on Paul Ekman who's featured here. 
um, in these pictures. And him and Dr. Levinson basically created this facial coding system to kind of quantify those universal expressions. And they are based on your eyebrows and the creases of your mouth. Um, and as you can see here, uh, you know, this is a, a so you go on the left and right, there's the sadness and there's the happiness and you can tell the difference in the eyebrows and the creases of the mouth. And so um, basically undergraduates at UC Berkeley would be trained over three months to identify all these emotions, the happiness, fear, disgust, confusion, interest, anger, surprise, sleep, sadness, natural emotion, or neutral emotion on the four point scale with none, slight, moderate, or strong. And we basically had them code almost all the videos we, we took in the lab. So that's the way that we really kind of quantified um, the facial expression. Um, so for my first question I had before starting this project, can this even be studied in the lab? So we brought in 21 patients uh, with pseudobulbar affect. 19 to 21 of them had episodes in the lab. We had eight with crying, four with laughing, seven with both, 56 episodes with detailed self-report, the first time this was really done, uh, and then 14 ALS controls with no episodes via uh, self-report. So can it be studied? Yes, you probably put that together sometimes showing you videos from the lab. Um, but uh, just looking at the population we had, so there was no differences in age. There was a higher predominance in males in both groups, but they weren't, uh, they were equal. Uh, this, the CNSLS or the lability scale that we use in clinic was definitely higher in our um, patients with pseudobulbar affect. There's no difference in the uh, Beck's depression index. Uh, and as shown previously, there was a higher incidence of kind of bulbar symptoms in our patients with the pseudobulbar affect. So then for these next set of questions, um, how did these episodes occur? Is this just kind of spontaneous firing? Are they linked to the environment or this kind of exaggeration of, emo of emotion? I'd actually go to the self-report data first. So if patients had an episode in the lab, we'd ask them, we'd stop We'd, we'd uh, stop what we were doing at that time and say, did you just have an episode of emotion that was difficult to control? Please describe what happened. Did anything set off this episode? How did you feel during the episode? Uh, and how did you feel during, uh, or how did you feel during the episode? Quantify the intensity and we'd screen for all the different emotion types. Because a lot of people in the literature also are saying people would have these kind of mixed emotion types. And actually to our surprise, People were actually reporting rather strong emotions, at least in that very first episode. So a 5.2 out of 8 in laughing episodes and a 6.4 in crying episodes. And also about that mixed episode things, at least when we look at the very first episode, the top reported emotion in um, the laughing episodes was uh, amusement and happiness, followed by enthusiasm, excitement, and contentment. And in crying episodes, the first emotion reported was sadness, followed by compassion and poignancy. And how many of these episodes were uh, linked to specific triggers? So actually 100% of the crying episodes, um, patients cited things like thinking about a sad event, my kids, my wife, my disease, that I won't be there in the future, all sad things. The majority of laughing episodes were cited with specific triggers. Uh, Borat uh, was one, flatulence was a reoccurring theme, uh, and one guy had a very specific image, a visual image of guys in helmets clubbing each other to Yanni's greatest hits which was actually this very specific, I guess, line that Vince Vaughn says in the movie The Breakup. But any time you even thought about Vince Vaughn and that, you just would, it would get him every time. So, uh, so this shows, though, that antecedent events are present. So that means that this model I talked about uh, is valid for this. So now, what about when we want to look at the appraisal and the response? So for this, I'd actually look at the watch portion of our session. So. Do patients um, with pseudobulbar affect report stronger emotions when just viewing uh, the stimuli? And so here, let me set this up. So the blue is the patients with pseudobulbar affect. The red is the con uh, basically our, our controls. And uh, on this side is the amusing and the sad. And there was no statistical difference in patients reporting. So this means that um, patient looks like the uh, appraisal uh, was intact. Now are patients displaying more emotion when watching these? So for this, I actually would go to the facial coding. And so to set this up, so uh, on this side, there, the, these two on the left are the amuse watch, and we just are showing happiness and sadness coding. And on the right is the sad watch with happiness and sadness coding. And so you can see a little bit difference, but there wasn't any statistical uh, difference between these two. So I think this shows that patients are able to experience emotion without always having an exaggerated response. And I think that people are able to tell you this, but no one's ever really shown this or had data kind of showing this um, before. 
So we also looked at just what the episodes look like compared to normal emotions. So we took kind of the most emotionally rich part of the episode and compare that to uh, the most rich part of the, ep of the uh, sorry, the most emo richly part of a pseudobarbaraphic episode with the most emotionally rich part of the film. Um, so about 30 second bins. And to set this up, this is actually from the paper, but basically the top is the amusing, the lower is the crying. Um, on the left here is the subjective experience, the facial behavior, and the physiology. And basically all three of these were higher in the pseudobulbar affect um, episodes than the films. So now uh, we've shown that the appraisal is intact. People can have, uh, not always have an exaggerated response. So now what about when we look at the regulation? So again, we look at the kind of regulation portion of the section. Um, and so this was our significant finding. So setting this up again, um, here on the left we have amusing films, uh, watching, suppressing, reappraising, and then sad, we have the facial behavior, and let's see, do I have a mouse? So here, the suppression was statistically different. Uh, between the gray is controls, and the, the black is uh, the pseudobulbar affect, and the reappraisal uh, approach significance. So this actually showed that there was, it did like there, look like there was difficulty in the regulation uh, tasks, um, at least for amusing. I think we didn't get quite uh, the same kind of signal in the, in the sad, and maybe that's just because people are, are better controlling uh, when they're watching kind of sad films, even sad ones like 21 Grams. Um, but just to kind of emphasize this again for the, uh, the whole team working on this, that this took nine months of UC Berkeley undergraduates coding about 74,000 seconds of film. And I, luckily I did have enough money in my grant that I could uh, give them a stipend for that. Then we looked at the subjective experience. Were people rating the films any differently? Again, here on the left is amusing. Uh, B, is, uh, B is sad on, the, on that side. And we're doing watch, suppress, reappraise. And we actually, although you can see the black, the pseudobulbaraphic, everyone's reporting a little bit more than the controls. When we looked at this multiple ways with statisticians, it did not look like they were, um, uh, that there was any statistical difference in how they rated all the films. So I think this showed that the films are relatively pretty well counterbalanced and um, um, and, and at least of equally kind of strength. And then unfortunately, uh, we did not find any difference uh, in the physiology which they had shown in controls. Um, and I think again, it might just be more because of the, 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 the film stimulus. And then what about when we actually looked at that, uh, the brain stem with that acoustic startle that I showed you? Um, and so we actually did not show any uh, changes in self-report, uh, and that was mostly in fear, the facial coding, and the physiology. Uh, so it actually looked like the brainstem was looking like it was relatively normal. So what does this tell us about the neuroanatomy of pseudobulbar affect? It shows that maybe Dr. Wilson back in 1924, although he did not really have the same kind of data from an emotions lab, might have been correct. So in this project, I still have many questions about pseudobulbar affect, but even as a medical student, I was able to get some answers. Uh, so I had some data showing, now I have some data. Uh, for patients with ALS and pseudobulbar affect. These events look like they are linked to emotion. Patients are reporting specific triggers uh, and strong emotions, um, at least for the first events. I think if people have lots of events, that that might be when people start having more mixed feelings because they might be getting kind of annoyed that they're having 10 or 20 events. Um, uh, the display of emotion that was congruent with the reported feelings, uh, the appraisal is, re is intact, uh, and people uh, don't always have a, an episode um, you know, stimulated by anything. Uh, patients also had impaired performance in the amusement regulation tasks. We did not have detected a difference in the brainstem with the acoustic startle. We have some inkling that Wilson's theory might be correct. So this actually ended up being my uh, MD with thesis. Uh, and it was published in 2011, so I spent about two years on this project, even though the grant was for one year, spent a long time writing it up even as an intern. So I ended up uh, then going to do my internship uh, in Oakland, and then my general neurology uh, down at UCLA. Then I came back to UCSF, and I specifically started studying neurodegenerative disease. Okay, I'm almost done, okay. Uh, and and uh, gotta, gotta get faster here. Um, uh, really in dementia, and in the last two years, I really started focusing more on uh, clinical care of ALS, as well as um, trying to get ALS research. And during my time with the dementia world, I also started doing neuroimaging. So it just actually worked out that um, someone up, the, the multiple sclerosis group upstairs started developing this new protocol that separated gray and white matter in the spinal cord. Um, 
and it had not been done in ALS yet, so I applied for the AN uh, ALS Fellowship, and I was very lucky, and I got it. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this um, sequence and the biomarker um, called phase sensitive inversion recovery. Um, so at least how I think about this would be, again, how this kind of applies to ALS is you, the upper motor neuron goes from the cortex down the spine um, in the white matter, and then there, the lower motor neuron then is from the anterior horn cells and the gray matter going to the muscle. And you can see here just this is how a normal cord would look with this nice kind of butterfly shape being the gray matter. Here's some other kind of uh, anatomical depictions, again, just showing this nice kind of gray matter signal, which um, it's, it's actually hard to see in conventional imaging. And challenges of spinal cord imaging, basically there's the small dimension of the spinal cord. You also have to think that it's the soft tissue that's wrapped in bone, so that can create a lot of uh, artifacts. There can also be problems with movement, swallowing, CSF pulsation, respiration. Uh, I already mentioned kind of the bone. The coils, with, uh, I guess, throw off some of the physicists I'm collaborating with. And there's generally just too much noise to get good gray, gray and white matter um, separation. So just briefly, conventional MRI. T2 is usually what we use for kind of detecting some kind of uh, abnormality or is there any kind of pathology going on in, in the uh, spinal cord. This isn't really great for volumes and you can't see gray and white matter. And typically this would be normal as part of a ALS workup. Um, and then we do have T1 imaging. This gives us a good just general volume, but it just tells us kind of the cord, but not the gray and the white matter part of the cord. So to tell you just briefly about this phase-sensitive inversion recovery, this was one of the big uh, papers that they did in, uh, this was in, in controls, uh, showing that it actually works. And this is where we actually took our controls from to compare. Um, basically, it's just a two-minute sequence per level, and you actually align this to shoot between the discs, so you're shooting between the vertebrae. Um, and it basically creates, uh, you do a two GRE pulse, um, and there's, there's this phase reconversion sequence and lots of complicated physics I won't go into right now. There's a little graph kind of there. Uh, and it basically makes this image. And this is really like a perfect image because this is like a normal control and it's even traced out to show the gray and the white matter. But this is actually what the output is of this sequence. And we actually can either have computers trace it for us or we can manually trans trace this. And basically then we can take a gray and a white matter volume and then my kind of job was once the physicist would give this output is to see is there any kind of clinical significance to this. So we actually looked at uh, four different levels in the cervical cord uh, highlighted here. And we actually had quite a diverse group of patients with motor neuron disease. So we included uh, PLS, ALS, FTD, ALS, uh, PMA, and even uh, FOSMIN, which is a uh, facial onset sensory motor neuropathy that often progresses then to a motor neuron disease like ALS. Um, and so, and it was very hard to re recruit people, I found out, uh, for this project, but these are our patients that were very nice and volunteered. Um, and when we basically graphed them just as a whole group, uh, kind of to our surprise again, we were seeing some pretty um, big changes. So the line here is actually the controls from that paper I showed earlier, and the individual dots is each, the whole group as a level at those levels. So basically all the dots below the line mean that there's um, significant changes, or what I would consider atrophy. Um, and so we really saw this in basically all levels, even looking at the whole group, except for maybe the white matter at the C7-T1 area. And how, how, how does this actually would kind of work as a biomarker? I think that the best case, um, it still needs more work and more numbers, but I think it might be a way to kind of further define all these different phenotypes that are in this heterogeneous population of ALS. So as we know, kind of if you're at the far extreme of more pure upper motor neuron or PLS or pure lower motor neuron with PMA, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, the uh, survival is thought to be about 10 years, maybe even double that of traditional ALS that has the combination of upper and lower motor neuron. So I think that actually where this would probably help are people that probably have ALS but are at farther ends of the spectrum, and this might be a way to either kind of reinforce the exam or it might even be able to detect other uh, kind of under underlying areas of both the gray and the white matter. So definitely we still need a lot more data, but we actually thought this was still exciting given this was the first 10 patients with the sequence ever scanned. Um, so even looking at this individually, uh, you can kind of extrapolate a lot of things and really to look at patients with a, to an individual scan, you probably need more like 100 scans. But when we looked at it, say subject 8 and 10 really only had symptoms in the bulbar region and we're really not seeing any kind of atrophy. Also patient 6 clinically was um, 
only primary lateral sclerosis, so only upper motor neuron, and we actually are seeing changes in his gray matter and his white matter, which was, um, you know, kind of surprising, but that's also been shown in, uh, in studies looking at pathology as well. So um, I'm probably running short on time here. So uh, I think next steps really now, I think even with this early study, we've submit this for review, um, but I think already at UCSF we're playing a role this out um, in clinical scans. So I'm hoping this might be a scan I could bring to Providence once it's at that, skate, at that stage. Also we're planning to explore kind of lower thoracic levels. Um, I also had a side study with this, trying to start develop neurofilament um, and correlate this with different kind of uh, imaging patterns. So some of the next steps for me, uh, first moved to Portland, uh, started that this weekend, uh, and uh, joined the team at Providence, really excited to start getting involved in clinical trials, uh, already been starting to get involved in some of these national ALS registries, uh, and look forward to making more collaborations up here um, in the Northwest, because I really think some of the this kind of deep clinical phenotyping, which is what I would kind of classify my projects as, combined with collaborations with basic scientists and pharmaceuticals uh, is really where the kind of treatments and cures uh, for ALS are gonna come from. So I think it's, again, it's, it's an exciting time to be a part of this research and I look forward to the next step. Uh, so with that, I also need to uh, just thank all the collaborators I have had at UCSF. So the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, uh, my mentors there, Dr. Bruce Miller and Dr. Howie Rosen, uh, also, I've been collaborating with the UCSF ALS Center and the uh, director there, Dr. Kathy Lomanhurth, and I have to thank all my ALS patients and their families for putting in the time to actually participate in these uh, rather kind of experimental projects I've, I've been doing. Uh, specifically for the pseudobulbar affect, uh, Dr. Levinson and his lab was very helpful, and that was funded by the Doris Duke Foundation. For the PSER project, uh, Nico Papanudo, Antia Bishop in the Roland Henry Lab, and I have to thank the AN and, the, and ALSA for funding those projects. And thank you very much for coming today. Very honored to be here. Uh, and thanks for uh, listening to me talk about my research. <laughs>